Um, in case you guys don't know, my name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here, and we've been going through the book of Acts. Um, we're going to be continuing our journey in Acts today, as you can see on the screen there. Um, and we're going to do that till Easter, actually. And that'll get us to the end of Acts chapter 3, and then we're going to be moving on to something else for a while, and then returning to Acts in the future. Now, I don't know how many of you know this about Grace Fellowship, but I think it bears repeating. Um, we at Grace Fellowship like to go through books of the Bible. We love the Bible. And so what this does, as we go through these books of the Bible, it kind of allows us to um, teach about things that are maybe uncomfortable to teach about, um, subjects that are maybe controversial or that are just uncomfortable. It doesn't allow us to just skip over it because of, as we're teaching through the Scripture, we have to address these things that the Scripture brings up. And so it really forces us to really look at what Scripture says about really every aspect of our lives instead of just maybe the feel-good parts or the parts that I enjoy teaching about because I know a lot about it, but it really forces me as well as you guys and together as a church family for us to dig through these Scriptures and really see what God has for us. So today we're going to take Acts chapter 3, or sorry, chapter 2, verses 22 to 36, and it really just builds on what Clay preached about last week. Um, Clay preached about uh, on the first part of the sermon that Peter had, and uh, we're going to be taking the second part of the last part today. Um, this is the sermon that Peter preached right after the Holy Spirit came to the early believers at Pentecost, and all these uh, supernatural, miraculous things were happening. Um, there was crazy stuff happening. Many people started gathering around. There was sounds and tongues of fire and people speaking different languages. And so Peter, he starts preaching during this whole time. And, and I just love how Peter starts reassuring the people that this is something that's from God. And he quotes the prophet Joel. And that's where, uh, that's what Clay preached through um, last week, the parts, uh, the part of his sermon that uh, quoted the prophet Joel from the Old Testament. And he was really, uh, Joel, the prophet Joel was really just foreshadowing the coming of Christ in the New Testament. Today we're going to continue on in Peter's sermon where he just continues to prove that Jesus is God by the writings of the prophets of the past. And um, these prophets were people that the Jewish people really revered and they would have known. They held these writings from these prophets in very high regard. So, but before we dig into this today, um, let's just watch the scripture video. You can follow along in your Bible or on your phone, whatever you like. Um, it's going to be playing here. You can follow along on the screen as well. And then we'll dig in. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 22 to 36. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Let's just pray before we dig into this. Uh, Lord Jesus, I just want to say thank you for the book of Acts. It's, it's been a real encouragement to me when I just see how the gospel spread like wildfire in the early church. And we know you can do a work like this today. 
And I just pray that you would. Lord, you know our hearts. You know how selfish they often are. And I just want to pray that you would give us a burden for the lost. That the things that we do in our everyday lives would have a purpose. And I pray that the purpose would be to make your name great here in Mormon. Help us to see the reason that we're all in the situations that we are in. The reason that we have a particular job is so you can use us there. The reason that we're in particular neighborhoods is so you can use us there. The reason we're involved in different sports and things is so that you can use us there. We are people to be used by you. And I just pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to take over this city and just use us however you see fit in the process of revival, Lord. Lord, please use me today to speak truth. I pray that my own words would just get out of the way and that you would use my mouth to motivate us towards gospel thinking and gospel living today. Thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. We just pray that you would be here today. Amen. So let's start off today in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start off in verse 22, right after Peter was trying to prove that Jesus was really um, God and he had literally died and rose again by quoting from prophet Joel in the Old Testament. Clay went through this last Sunday, like I mentioned. Peter continues like this in verse 22. He just continues on preaching. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. It's kind of like saying, if you still don't get it after I explained it with prophet Joel, um, I have something that will help you get it a little more easily. If you don't understand what I just said, I'm going to repeat myself in a little different way that's going to make it clear to you. So Peter's attempting to make it very obvious that this Jesus who was on earth, who died and rose again, was really God. And this power that he had on earth is what they were experiencing at that time. All these miraculous signs, the speaking in different languages, the the fire like tongues and the sound of wind. And This was the power of God. He's trying to prove this. And he goes on to say, Jesus of Nazareth, this is in verse 22 still, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. And I'm just going to stop there. And Peter just starts off with, with proving that Jesus is God by using God himself as a witness. He says, Jesus was a man that was attested by God. That seems kind of like a weird sentence. I don't know how many of you use the word attested on a regular basis, but I don't. It's not in my vocabulary. But um, it's almost like saying confirmed or affirmed. If I attest to something, it's I confirm that what so-and-so says is true, or I affirm what so-and-so says is true. Like if Clay were to tell you that he drives a beige car, I can attest to the fact that Clay drives a beige car. And I'm attesting with my words right now that Clay drives a beige car. I could do it in another way. I could attest with something else, like with a photo. I could say, here's a photo of Clay's car, and I would be attesting to the fact that Clay has a beige car with a photo. So there's different ways to attest to something. So when the people were wondering if Jesus was really God, God attested to that fact with what? If we go back to verse 22, we see with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So Peter's saying, God knew that you wouldn't believe that Jesus is God. And so I did all these miracles and crazy things through Jesus so that you would know that he is God. Now, Jesus raised people from the dead. He healed the sick, you know, fed 5,000 people with like a small amount of fish and bread. And he walked in water. He turned water into wine. When the people were asking, is this Jesus really God? God was attesting to the fact that Jesus is God. Look at all the things he's doing. It's his testimony through Jesus. In the last part of verse 22, Peter says, as you yourselves know, he's like, it's pretty obvious. He's saying, you guys saw with your own eyes. How can you not believe? You've seen it for yourself. Peter's basically dumbfounded that they wouldn't believe with all the proof of Jesus's life here on earth. Then Peter starts to really kind of hit them where it hurts, and he puts the responsibility of the death of Jesus on them. If we read verse 23, he says, This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Now, I love how he tells them that even though God was verifying that Jesus was God, they didn't believe. And then, through God's sovereign plan, God's perfect plan, he allowed those guys to crucify him. He says, Jesus was killed by you. Even after all that Jesus did on earth, proving that he is God, he was crucified by men like you and I. Now, can you imagine hearing Peter um, speak and he's speaking to like thousands of people and I imagine he's a really good speaker, but he's just like, listen, you guys, you saw Jesus here on earth. There is no way he could have done these things if he wasn't God. 
And maybe you would have started to believe, yeah, maybe this, maybe this Jesus guy was God. Hearing this guy, this Peter guy explain it just makes it so much clearer. I think maybe he was God. And then Peter hits you with, well, it's your fault he's crucified. You guys did it. It's all your fault. You're all responsible for the death of Jesus. You see, we are all responsible for the death of Jesus. We all have disbelief and sin in our hearts. And at some point, and maybe even right now, we have this sin in our hearts and we've, we've really, we're crucifying Jesus. He was crucified to pay the penalty of our sin. He was crucified to pay the penalty of all sin, our sin. You and I put him on that cross. It was God's perfect plan, as we could see in verse 23. It was God's sovereign plan. It was his perfect plan. The death of Jesus was not ever plan B. It was always plan A, to save humanity from its own sin. But the responsibility still lies with us as people. We have sinned out of our own desires. This would have really hurt me if I would have heard this from Peter, I think. He just explains it so clearly that this Jesus that was on earth, he is God. And then he hits you with, uh, yeah, it's your own fault he died. You know, you didn't believe him, and now you killed him. Can you imagine how you'd feel after? I don't know if any of you have ever done something in the heat of the moment because it was, it was fun and it ended up turning out really badly. Maybe you were doing something stupid because everyone else was. And maybe somebody got hurt really badly and uh, there was maybe lifelong consequences or, or maybe even somebody died and you live with that regret all of your life and you just wish that you could turn back time and heal that person or bring them back to life. That's kind of how I imagine these people might have felt at that time. In verse 37, if we just skip on, and I'm not really going to get into that verse today, but it says that the people were cut to the heart. They were, they were filled with regret this was something they wished they had not done. Together with you and I, they had caused the death of Jesus. They had made it necessary for the crucifixion of Jesus. When they understood this, it cut them to the heart. And going back to verse 24, Peter offers them some hope after hitting them with a responsibility like, guys, it's your fault that he's dead. He says this, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. They might have been responsible for the death of Jesus, but Peter says, you know what? You don't need to worry about it now because it is impossible for him to be held by the chains of death. We have the God of eternal life. In fact, Peter goes on and says, David prophesied about Jesus raising from the dead. Last Sunday, Clay went through the part where Peter quotes Joel, and now, now Peter's going to start quoting David from the Old Testament. Centuries earlier, out of Psalms chapter 16, Peter says these words, and we'll read verses 25 to 28 of Acts chapter 2. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made it known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of glad gladness with your presence. Peter is using this foreshadowing from the Old Testament, these writings from David many, many years earlier to show that Jesus was not going to stay dead. Even though he'd been crucified, he wasn't going to stay that way. David had written this in the Old Testament thousands of years earlier. In verse 27, we can see that um, his soul would not be abandoned to Hades, meaning the deep pit or hell or place of the dead, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's not a warm, fuzzy place. Well, it's very warm, I guess, hot, but it's not this comfortable place. Um, regardless of the exact meaning of Hades, um, we get this feeling that it would have been a terrible place to be. And David had actually said that his uh, soul would not be abandoned to Sheol in the Old Testament. If you read Psalms, or at least in the version, ESV version, you'll read those parallel verses. You'll see that he says Sheol, but it, in the New Testament, they translate it as Hades. It's really the same thing, just with a different word. Both words mean a very terrible place. And Jesus wasn't going to be abandoned to that place. He wasn't going to be abandoned to death. He was going to rise from the dead. And it also says in verse 27 that David said, your Holy One will not see corruption. In other words, Jesus is not going to die and decay. Now he's going to live again. Now, I love how Peter uses these Old Testament scriptures that the Jews would have had at the time. To the Jewish people, these old writings were true scripture. Peter uses that to prove that this Jesus whom they did not believe was really God. He had really come to pay the price for man's sin. 
And I love how Peter just continues on in verse 29, just to make everything obvious. If, if they weren't getting it now, he just says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. He's saying this, if you read the words that David wrote in Psalms, and, and I know I've done this before too, if you just read it, it can seem like David is talking about himself instead of Jesus. Even just the one verse out of Psalm 16. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. It can sound like David's talking to God about himself. It can sound like he's saying, God, you're not going to let my soul die. You won't let me see decay. But Peter says, I can assure you that David is very, very dead. His tomb is still there and he's just as decayed as anyone else that has died. No, David was talking about Jesus, who is very much alive and always will be. And Peter hit this point again in verse 30, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. Here, I'm just going to stop there. Here in verse 30, Peter uses the promise that God made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, both different versions of the same story where God promises to David that his kingdom would be established forever. This Jesus that came to earth was of the physical line of David. You could trace his physical lineage to this amazing hero King David. The Jews held him in very high regard. And Peter just pushes this point in verse 31, that King David thousands of years earlier had foreseen the resurrection of Jesus and had written about it in the scriptures. He foresaw, verse 31, of Acts chapter 2. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This King David prophesied about Jesus, and he was also promised that his kingdom would be established forever. And this Jesus was a fulfillment of that promise. I love how in the next verse, after Peter just finishes using their hero to prove that this Jesus was really God, in verse 32, he says, this Jesus God raised up, and of that, we all are witnesses. Now, Jesus was raised up, and the disciples had seen him. I love that verse 32. It just states it. You guys saw it. We're witnesses of it. Jesus was raised up. He's alive. And Jesus has died, and it was our fault that he died. But he wasn't going to stay dead. They should not have even needed Peter's explanation of who Jesus was. It should have been obvious. I would have thought, if I was living back then, would I be, which side of the fence would I be on? I don't even know. In verse 33, Peter tells him where Jesus is now. He says, he's sitting at the right hand of God. He, he raised from the dead and he ascended. There, verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and he poured out the Holy Spirit that they're experiencing right then. This is right at Pentecost. This amazing experience where everyone could understand in their own language. They had these tongues of fire and this huge noise like wind and, and all these miraculous signs. This is the kind of God that we serve. He's saying, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, and he's poured out the Holy Spirit on us, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what you guys are experiencing now. That's why you all came together. You all heard these strange noises. You could all understand us. You saw this weird tongues of fire on us. This is God, the one who has authority and power over everything. And Peter, Peter even goes further and tells him that not only is Jesus alive and sitting at the right hand of God, but this is another thing that David predicted. David predicted the resurrection of Jesus, but he also wrote about Jesus sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. In verses 34 and 35, Peter quotes David again from the Old Testament Psalms. Verse 34, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, and, and this is what David says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He's again saying David wasn't talking about himself like you guys all assumed. He was talking about Jesus, this Jesus who you did not believe was God. He was predicted by your hero, king, prophet, David. That's who Jesus is. So now that these people knew all this information about the fact that Jesus was God, that he did die, he was crucified for them, their sin was to blame for his death, and he rose again, he had ascended into heaven, and he was sitting at the right hand of God. And not only did they know this because it physically happened during the time that they were on this earth, 
which would have been really neat to see, but many of them would have actually seen some of these events take place. They could have, and they could see that this very situation that they were in right now was predicted in the Old Testament by David, by Joel. And after hearing all that and knowing all that and being like, wow, this actually, Jesus was God, they have this gut reaction that just cut to the heart. In verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, they felt terrible for the things that had happened and that had transpired. And then Peter hits them on the head one more time with this statement in verse 36. I, I like this one. He says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He had gone through all the physical events that had recently taken place, the ancient prophecies that had come to this point. And the main purpose and the whole event of this Pentecost, all these tongues of fire, these speaking in languages, the mighty sounds like wind, Peter's speech, it was all for one thing, that the world would know that Jesus is God. We are responsible for our sin. This is a fact. I think Peter got his point across pretty effectively. So we're going to find later, as we continue on, that 3,000 people came to know and realize that Jesus was Lord that day. If we were there that day, which side would you have been on? The side that already believed? There was a small group of believers already there, the disciples, and probably about, I don't know, maybe 100 or 200 people with them. Or would you have been with the side that saw all these miraculous signs, all these wonders, and still didn't believe. The experiences that these people witnessed, they didn't change their hearts. They didn't believe Jesus was actually God. Where do you fall today, really? We're all at a different place in life, and our relationships with Jesus Christ range from no relationship at all, maybe, to a wonderful worship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice that when Peter stood up to speak to this crowd, he was with, with two kinds, those who did not yet know Christ and the people with him who knew Christ well. And what we find is this. When the people heard the truth about God, many, not all, but many were brokenhearted at the horrible sin that they had committed. They had essentially crucified God, Christ, the one who was actually God. Many of them were probably in that same crowd yelling, crucify him, you know, a month and a half earlier. Many of them had probably chosen to release Barabbas instead of Jesus, thinking Jesus was some sort of heretic. But many of them now realized the error of their ways. And this is what happens when the Holy Spirit is showing his power. Jesus is made much of. You cannot deny the power of Christ when the Holy Spirit is working in you. You see, Peter's speech was pretty good, except it was not really him who is speaking. It was the power of the Holy Spirit in him. This was Pentecost. The Holy Spirit had just come. You see, sometimes when I start speaking, uh, the words that come out don't really make a lot of sense. Probably a lot of the times. Unlike Peter's speech here, I mumble and bumble my way through the scripture, hoping that you're going to kind of see the truth that lies in this scripture, hoping that through all my uh, mixed up words, you guys can understand what God is trying to say to you. But I feel as though I have this one thing in common with Peter. I'm, I'm not qualified to do the work that God's called me to do. I, I, I'm not smart enough. I, I'm not maybe old enough or eloquent enough. And when you really analyze me, you're going to find out that I have sin in my life, I've had catastrophic failure in my life, just like Peter. Peter even denied Christ. But you know, God works in amazing ways. When the power of the Holy Spirit enters you and fills you, these strange things start happening. God works through weakness, through inadequacy, through poor education, through stuttering, through sinners like you and me. God uses what man defines as weakness and turns it into strength. How else could Peter, an uneducated fisherman, convert 3,000 people to Christianity in one day? It was the Holy Spirit using him as a tool to spread the gospel. And this is the point we've been trying to drive home in the last while. When the Holy Spirit shows his power in his people, more people come to know him. In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus had told his disciples to stay in Jerusalem until they were clothed with this power from on high. And now it had happened. Peter was preaching. 
explaining the signs that they had seen. This was all Jesus, all the Holy Spirit. The whole event was the Holy Spirit working through people. It was all for the gospel. We are sinners. Jesus died for, for us. And then he rose again so that our sinful garbage would be paid for. When we believe this and we allow that truth to enter our lives, when we have a repentant heart, we receive this Holy Spirit as well. He is in us. You see, just me standing here is proof that God exists. If I think back to my high school days, I didn't care how much a particular report was worth. There was no way I would stand in front of a class to present it. I was too shy. It'd be too hard for me to do, so I just wouldn't do it. I would take a zero. Today I stand here, and even though I'm not a good speaker or a great speaker like some people are, I'm here, and I'm not scared. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in me. It's not me. For you, it might be something else. Maybe there's something God's called you to do so that his power can be shown in you as you are his person. He wants to use his people as tools to spread the gospel. You need to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to use you. Surrender your life for the sake of the gospel. I had to surrender what was comfortable to me to be standing here right now. And I hope you guys can see the power of the Holy Spirit working in your lives. When those people in that crowd saw the power of God working in Peter and the other disciples, it utterly changed their lives. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that next week. But lives changed, and not just a little bit, a lot. When they realized that the love that Jesus had for them, um, even though he was God, they completely gave up their lives to follow him. And this can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to give up your life on your own. This is not something that you can naturally do all by yourself. This is done by the power of the Holy Spirit. There were miracles. There were wonderful signs that God had power. They were no longer living for self. They were living for the sake of the gospel. And living for the gospel changes everything. It changes your philosophy of money, of retirement, of parenting, of friendship. It changes your philosophy of owning things, of getting ahead in life. Everything is now for the sake of the gospel. This wonderful story of Jesus, how he loved us so much that even while we were sinners, he died for us. Most of us here have more head knowledge about Christianity than the early church ever had. You've probably been educated in Sunday school all your life. Maybe you've been to Bible school. Maybe you've gone to church all your life. All this means nothing if it is knowledge only and doesn't change who you are at the core. The early believers were brokenhearted to the core. What should we do, they asked. Is this our response when we hear this story of what God has done? What do I do about it? Is that our question? Nothing we can do can change what we have done. We are just as much to blame for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as the early believers were. They may have been physically there, but God knew our hearts would be dark even then. He died for us. All we need to do is realize how sinful we are and repent and be baptized. And we're going to get into the more, that more a little bit next week. And when the people saw the power of the Holy Spirit working through the disciples, their hearts changed. I want to encourage you this week, just like I did a couple of weeks ago, start praying. Pray for this city. Pray for Warman. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for the people at work. Pray for anyone you know that needs Jesus. Pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to start working through you so that the people around you can come to know Jesus Christ. The power that we saw here in Acts chapter 2 was for the spread of the gospel. Now let's pray as community groups or small groups. Pray for this city, that there would be revival here, like the one we see in Acts chapter 2. I would love that to happen. That would be awesome. God is still powerful, and he can still work mightily through those of us who are very inadequate. I think most of us fall into that category, but probably none of you more than me. Um, God has used me, and I'm sure he's used you too. And it's only a taste of what he can do. Let's spend the next week praying for this city, surrendering all that we have and all that we are for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I just want to close in prayer. God, I just want to pray that you would help us as a small, insignificant group of people to radically surrender our lives to you so that we give you full control to use us however you see fit. Use everyone in here as tools to spread the gospel. We love you, Lord, and we love the people around us. And I just pray that 
If there's someone here who doesn't know who you are, please reveal yourself to them in such a way that there's no doubt in their mind that you are God and that you are a loving God. And God, if there are people here who do believe you exist but have never fully understood what that means or never fully surrendered to you and they haven't experienced this power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do work in their life so that everyone around them will know that you're God. Lord, we want to make much of you. We want to lift your name on high. And I just thank you for your work on the cross but also so much more for rising again and not allowing death to defeat you, Father, and defeating sin and death for us. And I just thank you for this, Lord Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen.